Hello. In uh, 1629, uh, Francois Pelsar, who was a, a Dutch navigator, was helping to uh, rescue some survivors of a ship that sank off of Western Australia. Um, and reported back, this is the first document, documented report by a European of such a thing, he, he reported back that he saw these animals. And he described them thus. They're about the size of a hare, their head, this was in Dutch, so it wasn't exactly this, but uh, they're about the size of a hare, their head resembling that of a civet cat. The four paws are very short, about the length of a finger on which the animal has five small nails or fingers resembling those of a monkey's forepaw. Its two hind legs, on the contrary, are upwards of half an L in length. An L is about a meter. A meter is about a yard. Um, and it walks on these only, on the flat of the heavy part of the leg. You might say that's one L of a leg. Um, thanks. Um, in, in fact, what Pelsart was describing uh, was probably something like this. Uh, this, is a, this is a tamar wallaby. Um, and in fact, was, was the first marsupial ever reported by a Euro having been observed by a European. Now, when Pelsar returned with this description, uh, because uh, photography had not been invented and he was not much of an artist, all he had was his linguistic description. Um, and, and yet, he was able to create in people's minds, as I hope was created in your mind, some sort of representation of the thing that was being described. He was able to report, as Lara just described, he was able to use the pops and whistles and hums, or in this case, the, the squibbles and the squaggles on, on a page. He was able to recreate in someone else's mind, uh, in this case, a vision of an animal that they had never seen before. He was able to create new knowledge through language. And uh, I'd like to offer this as, uh, as one of the test cases that one might um, like to investigate if we're interested in knowledge. Uh, it's how does language get deployed by humans in real, in real time, in real interactions, uh, to create new knowledge. So if you look at some of the language that I just, put, that I just grabbed out of that example, um, think about what, what exactly you have to do with this string of words. Uh, well, first of all, it is a string of words, right? There are, uh, and each of those words identifies a category of knowledge that you hold about the world. You know about what a hair is, you know what, what a head is, you know what size is, I guess. You may or may not know what a civet cat is. It, it, it hurts if you don't know what a civet cat is. But they look kind of like a wallaby. Um, at least their head does. And, um, but there's much more than this. Of course, it's not just the words that are contributing to your understanding of the whole. There's grammar, too. And uh, you have to know that, uh, it's the, uh, that they're the size of a hare and that their head resembles a civet cat and not the reverse. They're not the size of a civet cat with heads resembling a hare. And how are you able to do that? Well, obviously, grammar plays a role here. So how exactly are you able to accomplish this? How are you able to go from these words that you know, general grammatical rules about putting nouns together with verbs, prepositions with, uh, with nouns that aren't specific to civet cats or to wallabies? How are you able to take this and assemble some representation in your, in your head that constitutes new knowledge? Well, um, we don't know. But, uh, but work in my lab, and I decided to just sort of talk about one, a one aspect of this that I'm particularly interested in. Work in my lab um, is part of a larger movement within cognitive science more generally, and I think within work that's being done here um, at UCSD in particular, um, testing one hypothesis about one mechanism that might play some role in how we're able to do this, how we're able to make new knowledge. It's called the simulation hypothesis. Um, and it's the idea that maybe we understand language in part by simulating in our minds, that is recreating using systems for perception, systems for action, what it would be like to experience the things that the language describes. Maybe when you hear a description like this, um, you activate visual representations of what a hair looks like and how big it is, or what a civet cat looks like and what it's head is shaped like. Um, perhaps when describing, when people describe to you language about actions, you engage your motor system to recreate what it would be like to do that thing so that you can understand not only, not only what the action is that's described, but so that you can make inferences appropriate to it. What would the next thing be? 
what am I being asked to do in response to this? And so on. Now, uh, there are lots of ways to study this, uh, including brain imaging, electrophysiology. Uh, the work that we do in my lab is much lower tech than that. We have people read or listen to sentences while they're doing other things and have them press buttons and we measure reaction times. We have them move their hands around in the world and measure aspects of the time course and trajectory of that motion to get an indirect measure of how their motor system is being engaged while they're using language, understanding new words or new combinations thereof. Um, we measure what's happening in people's hands as they talk. Of course, language is communicated not just through the uh, vocal modality and sometimes not at all through the vocal modality. Um, uh, humans speaking uh, languages accompany their words with gestures and these can reveal things as Lara mentioned about the internal workings of their mental representations. Um, and uh, we're even interested in language uh, in situations that are slightly more ecologically realistic. We're interested in how systems for action and perception get engaged while people are using language in um, slightly higher impact situations uh, like this one, pun intended, um, where, uh, where, we have a, where, where we have people um, drive through courses on a driving simulator and ask how language about baseball games affects their ability to see trucks or to move out of the way of one. Um, there's a whole host of questions that one can ask about how people use their systems for motor control and perception to understand language about old things or new things. Here's some examples of some such questions that we're pursuing and other people around campus and, and around uh, the world in the, in the field are, are pursuing. Um, we ask when people engage their vision systems, so does it matter whether you uh, have previous experience with wallabies um, or with civet, cap, with civet cats? Um, when you are simulating, what's it doing exactly with respect to the mechanisms that you have uh, for language comprehension? Um, when we don't simulate, what do we do? So probably you're not engaging your vision system much or your motor system much when I say hi. In that case, what are you doing? How do you understand? What, what, are there other pathways to understand language? Uh, how do we deal with abstract concepts like infinity or Tuesday? Are you simulating then? Are there, is there visual content to those things? Um, how do differences in individuals affect, diff affect uh, differences in simulation? So uh, if you have lots of experience with wallabies, how does it change simulation? If you are a particularly uh, visual person versus an auditory person, how does that affect simulation? Um, how does simulation affect other things that we do in the world? So if we knock out a person's ability to simulate, does that affect their ability to remember what the language is about, to reason about what the language is about, to make inferences, um, to learn new knowledge, and so on? Um, grossly, how do we use simulation to create new knowledge? I'd like to thank you for your time and hope that through these few words, I've helped you to create some new ideas. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Ben. Are, does anybody have any questions? Uh, um, my notion now of, I'm going to be the opposite, my notion of a, of a civic cat is a wallaby. Right. Yes. Um, what do you think is the relationship, how would you describe in this context the relationship between what you're referring to as simulation and metaphor? Oh. Uh, well, simulation is meant to mean the sort of internal construction of uh, non-veridical, uh, perceptual, motor, emotional, affective experiences. Um, and those can be literal in the sense that if I describe a civet cat as being, uh, if I describe a wallaby as having the head of a civet cat, then you construct a visual representation of what, it's, what you believe it's supposed to look like. I would say that's kind of a literal simulation, but you could have metaphorical simulation. So, um, if I tell you that, uh, if I tell you that uh, spring break is uh, regrettably way down the road, um, and if you use some spatial representation of how it's distant and distant in front of us, then that would be a sort of a metaphorical use of simulation. Does that make sense? Kind of. We'll talk. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much, Ben. And.